Hello and welcome to another edition of The Tigers Down Under. I'm your host as always, Alex, and with me tonight I have Logan. How are you? Oh, good evening, Alex. Uh, yeah, I'm well, uh, despite the, the recent turn in form and uh, the, I guess the tough times that we seem to be experiencing at the city at the moment. I'm trying to stay positive. Uh, it's still early days, but um, yeah, certainly lots to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And and obviously we didn't have a podcast last week, so there's been a lot to talk about in terms of the general state of the club and also with the two results that we've had in the last seven days, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But as you've touched on there, we, we may as well start with the sort of uh, the general atmosphere around the club. And it's a very um, apathetic, I would say, atmosphere in, in the sense that, and I sort of discussed it on Twitter a couple of days ago, but When you think about it, the last five years of the club, we've seen either promotion season under Steve Bruce or else Premier League football in the three seasons in the Premier League, either two under Bruce and one under Phelan and Silva. Um, This is sort of the first season in about six or seven years that we've really been mid-table to lower table championship, not really looking likely to get promoted, not at this stage anyway, touch wood, looking likely to get relegated. It's a very... Uh, nothing sort of season in that sense and it's been quite a while since we've had one of those seasons and in that sense there seems to be obviously putting aside all of the issues with the club itself there seems to be a general apathy amongst supporters about the state of the games and 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 how we're really performing in them so what how how do you feel about the way that the club's sort of progressing this season in, in a general sense I think the first thing we've got to realise is that despite having some or experience some pretty positive times, uh, certainly with the the manner that we've gone about our football on the, the field and um, reaching cup finals and cup semis and and getting promoted and all the rest of it, uh, there's still obviously been some some gaping wounds, um, kind of or, or cracks starting to appear in the city makeup, and uh, that was obvious under Steve Bruce. Uh, it was certainly obvious under Mark Phelan, uh, even under Marco Silva, despite the results that we were getting. Uh, there was uh, certainly some apparent issues. This ongoing battle uh, with the Alums and the, and the fans uh, certainly hasn't been a, a quiet one and has been one that has kind of been building somewhat. Uh, I think at the moment we're probably starting to see the overflow of that um, with the way that things are on the on, on the field, the, the team that's actually playing and the, the manner that they're playing in uh, and certainly the, the unrest that has kind of ultimately reared its head in probably the most uh, aggressive way um, to date um, because the fans uh, are certainly aggrieved and I think with every right to be. And and I think I guess the issue is as well that um, as fickle as it is to say with football supporters as long as the team is winning a lot can be forgiven on the field. So for instance at the start of last season we had a very poor run into the start of the Premier League season but we got the two results against Leicester and Swansea and that sort of papered over the cracks and everyone sort of put away the protests and sort of swallowed it, so to speak, and, and sort of put up with it because the football team was at least performing initially. Uh, and then, of course, we went downhill from there and the malaise sort of came back, the discontentment. And we're certainly seeing that this season um, with a pretty poor run of results uh, under Slutsky uh, so far in the season. I think it's only four wins for the season as a whole. And, and yeah, as you say, everyone's pretty unhappy. You combine that with the fact that with the Hall of Fame, for instance, there's a whole bunch of issues with that, with the naming of that Hall of Fame, uh, and, and obviously the protests against Forrest, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, it's difficult to sort of see how things can improve this season, because I, I, I don't know, because unless we can sort of mount a late season sort of charge towards the playoffs, there's not a whole lot that can really improve around the club. No, that's exactly right. And I think that when we when we do cut it back to its its bare bones, if you will, there's the name change. There's the disregard uh, from the Allens to recognise the FA decision. Uh, there's the squad that Mark Phelan started with. There's the asset stripping that we've experienced at the moment. Uh, even something as simple as fudging the crowd numbers, which is clearly evident or uh, certainly happening at the moment, um, it really is a top-to-bottom approach. And I don't think that... The fans really have anything that they can celebrate at the moment under the Alabama administration. And um, I think that certainly with the the viewing of the protest and the way that the players responded or reacted after the protest, I think that it's finally got to a stage where it's now starting to become even apparent in the playing group. And I think that that's probably the thing that is hurting us the most and, and seems to be the, the kind of means to an end, if you will. 
Well, we, we'll start talking about that Forest game then, because that was where we really saw this manifestation of protest uh, with this Alan Wayne sort of con concept where uh, the whole City Action for Change group met before the game, marched to the stadium, and on, at 19 minutes and 4 seconds, uh, threw these stress ball sort of items onto the field. And it's been quite a contentious one. A lot of supporters have said that that affected the performance and was part of the reason we lost the game. Um... That being said, putting that aside, the, p the performance itself wasn't great. Whether or not that was due to the protests, I'm not so sure. Um, you, you, I mean, you say that there's not a whole lot of bright spots uh, at, the, at the moment in the team, but I think one of them is, is uh, definitely Jared Bowen. One of, if not the top scorer in the division for most of the season so far, uh, and scoring another great goal against Forest, but uh, ultimately a really poor result for us. So, so what did you make of the game as a whole? Uh, exactly as you called it. Uh, Jared Bowen is, is certainly the bright spark at the moment. Everything that he seems to be a part of um, seems to be positive. And the fact that he has mustered the amount of goals that he has uh, is incredible uh, feat for, for someone who was, was struggling to get game time. Um, certainly didn't see many minutes last year and seems to be one of our only bright sparks uh, is, is all that we almost have at the moment. And the fact that we're relying on a youngster like that who clearly isn't being given much support, um, certainly from a leadership front, um, in a team that looks very lost. Um, in the midfield, defensively, we look in tatters. And yes, there are some very positive patches in attack. The fact that he seems to be the, the linchpin is, is a concerning thing for all of us. Um, um, the game as a whole, uh, we look very lost. I can't remember a time where uh, we've conceded certainly three goals at home, but even to do it in back-to-back -back games. Um, the Middlesbrough result in itself... Um, was was really difficult to watch because it just never looked like we were in the game. Uh, and, and the Forest game, even though the scoreline was very misleading in 3-2, in they looked to have the run of play there as well. Uh, and I think that the fact that we're being turned over at home in that fashion is certainly something we haven't been used to seeing in the last five years because despite our frailties on the road, uh, we've always offered um, some kind of resistance at home and, and the fact that now uh, we're, we're seeing that we, we look to be str a team that struggles at home uh, is, uh, is really uh, very tough and, and hard for us to swallow at the moment. One thing you said there, it's something that we're not used to struggling at home, but another thing that we're not used to as well is being such an attacking force. And we're still, regardless of everything else, ridiculously, we're still equal top scorers in the division, which seems to me to be this ridiculous statistic when you think about the patchwork nature of the team and just our general make up as a club at least over the last six, seven, eight years uh, as being not a very high scoring team, not a very attacking team. And it's quite strange in a way that we've so suddenly flipped from having this issue of not having enough goal scorers to not being able to shore up our defence and really put in a resolute defensive performance. And it's obviously being played out on the national scale in Britain as well, where they're talking about Guardiola versus Mourinho and in the style of play, whether you grind out the one nil wins in Mourinho's um, style of play or the Guardiola 7-2 sort of victories that he gets against the, the teams like Stoke and things like that. As a City fan, it, it, it's it's really refreshing in one sense to see these sorts of high-scoring games, but it, it gets to a point where you think, okay, well, it's a 3-2 loss to Forest. We've seen a great goal from Jared Bowen, but you'd almost take just a, a gritty 1-0 like we had against Barnsley. That was one of the best games of the season. It's the first away, away win of the season. Gritty 1-0 away from home. Uh, you, you take one of those right now at home? Oh, without a doubt. And I think it is, is a never stark reminder of what we had under Steve Bruce, the, the championship specialist. And he's doing the same thing with Villa now. Uh, they had a, a, quite a slow start, but you can tell that he's more than happy to, to shut up shop and, and take the one nil victories and offer that resistance because it's about accumulating points. It's not about playing with flair. Um, we saw Fulham last year in the, the run-in for the championship probably by far and away the best side in the division, uh, bundled out in the playoffs um, yep. to, a, to a, a very harsh decision. And you see things like that and it makes you realise, obviously, the integrity of the championship is is a very, very tough league and you pick up points where you can and whether you're scoring goals or not, if you can muster three points with those boring one one nil games, well, then that's the, the matter that you do it and ultimately it puts you in a better chance to get promoted. Uh, and then just a final point on the Forest game, I, I sort of alluded to it before, but there was the protest at 19 minutes with the stress balls. A lot of fans have sort of pointed to that as sort of an excuse for the reason that we were, we lost the game. Um, 
I would tend to then point to the Middlesbrough game only three days later and suggest that, well, there was no protest in that game and we were still looking pretty terrible in that game as well. What's your take on that sort of um, physical sort of protest where you actually halt the game? I I guess you never really want to see a game of football affected to that extent, but uh, in front of the cameras, perhaps the supporters just feel like that's the most most appropriate way to sort of draw attention to the protests. Well, Alex, you and I were, were long-time stayers in the in the sense that we probably gave the the alums benefit of the doubt for much longer than um, a lot of the kind of other vocal fans would would like to have uh, extended that to them. Um, and I think now that if there was ever a time to to offer these protests, the fact that we are lowly ranked in the championship and the fact that we have had these problems for quite some time, something needs to be done and something needs to be changed. And I think that that's the general feeling throughout almost, oh, it feels like 90% of City fans at the moment. And if you're in a relegation scrap, uh, to stay up in the Premier League fighting for your life and these protests were swinging games, then you'd be very concerned. But as you said before, it looks like we're not going to get relegated, touch wood. It also looks like we're going to be nowhere near the six. Um, something needs to give. And whether that is the, the club finally being sold and put into the hands of people who actually have purpose and ambition with it, um, so be it. But between the fans and the arms, nothing is going to change. And I think that if you don't take uh, take your chance or the opportunity when it is televised or, or you do have national viewers and you can make those protests, well, when else are you going to be able to do it and offer that platform uh, to, to provide the change? And I think that it probably is, as, as morbid as it sounds, the, the right time to be doing uh, these, these protests because something has to happen. Absolutely. And we've already sort of touched on the Borough game, but we'll try and discuss it in a bit more detail now. Uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning here, uh, another pretty lacklustre performance at home. As you said, I mean, there wouldn't be too many occasions where we concede three goals at home, two games in a row. Um, Slutsky still seems to be trying to figure out his best 11, and we'll we'll talk about him in a bit more detail in a second. But he tried to mori it right back. Uh, especially in the Forest game, we saw that Aina was really getting exposed at right back and he really seems to be struggling there. It's almost as if he's the sort of player... I mean, he might well work better as a right wing back or even as a um, a right winger. I just don't see him as a right back long term, either in our team or elsewhere, because he just seems to be so exposed and seems to leave us so exposed on that flank. Tamori was tried there against Burrow to, no much, to not much more um, success. Now with Hector also suspended after that late red card, which was a little bit controversial in the, in the manner it was handed out, uh, he might well be drafted in at centre-back. But um, it just seems as if everything that Slutsky tries just isn't sticking at the moment. From a defensive point, we look frail across the board. I don't think it matters whether we look at uh, Aino, if we look at Hector, if we look at Dawson, if we look at Max Clark, there's, there's frailties there. And I think that's obvious for everybody to see. Uh, as you said, Slutsky still trying to work out what his best 11 are. But as you said, the fact that we're leading the division um, or top, equal first in, um, in goals scored and we're sitting at 17th on the on the table, that tells us that defensively we're well and truly off the pace. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I think that this is probably uh, rearing its head that Michael Dawson is very much so at the end of his career um, and is probably... Uh, as, as much as it pains me to say it, because he is such a, a good steward of the club and he, he does have that uh, that heart and that kind of tigerish approach that everybody has kind of loved with with having Michael Dawson and his brother as well. Um, I think it's probably time for him to to take a, a seat on the bench and offer that, um, still be around the club and still come off the bench when needed um, as, a, as a very useful replacement. But I think that if we're to be perfectly honest, um, for him to be starting... Uh, at centre back right now is is very risky, um, and I think that there needs to be a massive overhaul uh, with whoever the back three or back four are because it's clearly not working. Are you concerned? I mean, Dawson in the last year of his deal, Myler as well. Uh, that neither the, neither of them seem to have been offered new deals at this stage. You touched on there the fact that Dawson's probably getting to that stage where he should be sitting on the bench, but. He's expressed interest in coaching post-football. He's done his badges. He's done all that sort of thing. Are you concerned that there's not been any sort of approach to our club captain who has indicated that he wants to stay at the club to at least extend his stay in some capacity, whether it's, you know, a one-year deal with an option to deal, you know, two years as a coach? 
um, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it just seems as if the club is making no effort to retain these players. I know we've offered Hernandez a new deal, obviously very thinly veiled attempt at trying to get some sort of value out of him when he does move on next summer, which I think he'll do regardless of if he signs up or if he doesn't. Um, but unless the club sees some value in the player, they just don't seem interested in offering them a new deal at this stage. Uh, and certainly, but I think that that's the reality. That's what we've almost become accustomed to under the, the Alan regime. I mean, in all honesty, that's probably the same reason that Tom Huddleston mentioned why he left. Um, we have players of that calibre who, by far and away, you would be crying out for, for Tom Huddleston to be in the in the midfield offering some kind of resolve this, this season. Um, went to pe- went to Derby for, for absolute peanuts. And he, by all accounts, sounded like he was interested in staying, or well, certainly open to the idea. Um, and and he was obviously passed on. So it, whilst it is concerning, it's it's not surprising. And I think that's the reality of the, the kind of times we find ourselves in. Um, well, we'll move on and talk about Slutsky in a bit more detail. And it sort of flows in from that conversation um, about the, the nature of the contracts being offered to players at the moment. Um there's been a lot of criticism of Slutsky from both himself and the media, as well as some sections of the supporters. Uh, though I did see that there was a poll done recently on whether or not he should continue on as manager, and I think something like 65 or 70% actually said that they wanted him to stay. Um, there is an element in there, of course, about the fact that he's a very likeable character, and I think that sort of disguises to some extent his failings so far as a manager. And I think, for instance, when we had Nigel Pearson as a manager who was uh, a much less likable character that if he was going through a similar run of form, it would be a lot easier to turn on him or to criticize him than it is with Slutsky. But there also has to be some recognition, I think, of the fact that he's been put in a pretty untenable position by the Alums and the fact that they've tied his hands with his transfers. I think a lot of the transfers were quite clearly findings made by either the Alums or um, our director of football, Lee Denborough, I think his name is. Um, Players like, I mean, Fraser Campbell's been great for us so far in terms of the goals that he's scored, but he's clearly not a Leonard Slutsky signing. Slutsky hasn't come to England and thought, I need to go out and get Fraser Campbell into my Hull City side. So um, I think it's quite clear that he's been sort of, his hands have been tied in terms of the signings he's made. Um, but then, of course, the fact that we are a third of the way through the season, and, and you would sort of expect by this point that he would be able to pick. 11, 12, or 13 players that he could basically safely say, this is my best 11, and I can rotate between these two or three players, but this is basically the side that I think is my best chance at winning us games. And and the fact that he's still rotating players at this stage is clearly a cause for concern. So um, which side do you fall on in, in this debate about Slutsky's performance so far as manager? I think, as you mentioned and, and you touched on, it's it's somewhat... The Slutsky's performed as a manager. It's very hard to, to kind of give him a report card or make an assessment, given the fact of the kind of stability of, of the club and the situation he finds himself in. Um, I think statistically, and as we've talked about a lot already, the amount of goals that we've been score, uh, that we have been scoring is is, is quite an impressive um, haul. So... What Slutsky seems to be able to offer in um, attacking football is, is somewhat extremely promising and, and should be kind of uh, credited. Uh, it just seems that his, his shortcomings in defence, uh, whether that be the, the kind of system that the players are under or the fact that our defensive roster just isn't good enough, um, there certainly has a, a, him a lot to answer for in, in that respect. Um, when I saw the team announced this morning, I thought that it was a, a somewhat defensive-looking side, um, and it still ended up resulting in conceding three goals. Uh, so I think that what Slatsky is trying to work out is, is still a work in progress, and whether he's extended that time, I'm not so sure. Um, because he is a likeable character, I think that it has brought him um, the opportunity to have perhaps a, a little bit more uh, leeway that perhaps, as you said, may not have been extended to a, a less likeable character. But... I'm still not too sure um, if, if Slatsky is the right man for the job, but I think given the climate for us to have to go and look for a new manager, uh, if we were to sack him, would be a very, very difficult um, task. And I don't think at the moment there'd be many people putting their hands up to, to come in and, and, and take the whole city on, given the state it's in. Given his comments after the game against Borough, where he was sort of saying that uh, if the owners were to sack him, he wouldn't... Well, 
not to put words in his mouth, I think he has said something along the lines of if the owners were to sack him, he wouldn't be surprised or, you know, he'd accept their sort of decision. Uh, he hasn't lost confidence in the players. He hasn't lost confidence in the players. But if the owners have lost confidence in, in him, that's their decision to make. Do you think that the Sheffield United game this weekend is sort of a make or break game? I think leading into an international break is always a pretty crucial game if a manager's on the edge because... Obviously, with the two-week break, it gives the owners quite a bit of time to bring in a new manager and, and settle them into the club. Um, or do you think that's sort of unfounded and the owners aren't really in a position where they'd want to pay out a manager and bring someone else in? It's, it's a very difficult question to answer, um, given the, the farcical nature that everything seems to be done at the club at the moment. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to know where the, the Alums' heads are at. Um, I mean, in looking at the way that the club's being run at the moment, you were even got to ask yourself the question, is is success actually a goal of the Alums? Because in, in many of the decisions, it looks like they are just looking to sink the club, whether it is some kind of revenge attack on the fans or whatever it may be. Um, it, it doesn't certainly seem like they're showing the ambition that was kind of promised, uh, particularly by Ehab Alum in the, uh, the pre-season interview, talking about what their plans for the club were and how they were going to move forward and get signings done early. So where they're at with Slatsky uh, is anybody's guess. Um, I, I think that it would be very tough to to sack him on the, the fact of losing to a team that is absolutely flying by, by all accounts. Um, and certainly given City's away frailties um, long before Slatsky was ever at the helm, um, to, to lose on the road. I certainly wouldn't be surprised uh, if we were to lose to, to Chef and I can probably see it happening if I'm if I'm all on if I'm 100% honest and the pessimistic city approach at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it's a hard question to answer. I would say no. Well, we will talk about that game now against Sheffield United. Um, and as we tend to do before we get into the actual discussion, we can look back at some uh, enjoyable memories of games against our opponent for this week and it's a pretty easy game to pick out to discuss uh, leading into this one with a pretty famous and I think equals equal highest scoring uh, FA Cup semi-final result against them 5-3 at Wembley to book our place in our first ever FA Cup final. What are your memories of that game? I mean from my point of view um, I remember I, I was watching it at home I had a couple of friends over we actually had a bottle of champagne there ready to pop um, once the game finished and obviously Sheffield United got, got into the lead early and it seemed like it was going to be one of those games where it was just going to be a typical Hull performance or Hull City performance where everything was sort of expected of us. It was just sort of a formality of getting through this game and we were going to blow it. And I think it was we were 1-0 down uh, or maybe even 2 Were we 2-0 down, I think, before Sagbo yeah, got that goal late at the end of the first half? Yeah, I think it yeah. was. And then Fright <laughs> scored early in the second half, I think. And, and just as we got back on level terms... I think they scored again, uh, and then it was, what was it, Quinn, then Huddleston, Seven. then Myler all scored uh, to give us a pretty comfortable win in the end. It was, it was something like, I can't quite remember the order of the goals, but yeah, it was a pretty exciting result in the end. Yeah, certainly. I think the, the Huddleston goal for me was the one that, that stands out, um, just because it was, you saw glimpses of Huddleston, uh, in, you knew how good he was off both feet, but the fact that he actually took someone on and created that opportunity on the edge of the box, uh, it was just a, a stunning finish. It was, it was a really un-Tom Huddleston-like goal. And, um, and funnily enough, I think the player that he took on, or one of the players he took on, was one Harry Maguire, who would uh, and, shine in black and amber in a couple of seasons. Well, and that was the other thing that I was going to say that sticks out fondly as memory, was remembering just how good Harry Maguire was that game, um, particularly towards the end of the, um, the end of the game. I remember him going on one of his barnstorming runs and, and finding some space, and the commentator nearly peed himself when he <laughs> screamed out Maguire. Um, and, and I do remember just the, looking at that unnatural large physique and the, just the quality that he had on the ball. and. Um, as you said, the, the, the rest is history um, as, as far as uh, Harry coming to, to then shine in a black and amber jersey. But, uh, yeah, I remember being impressed by him at the time. I, I reckon that must have been the game that, got, uh, that convinced Steve Bruce to sign him the following summer. So uh, it was a very, I guess from his point of view, it's sort of an interesting summer to move from Sheffield United to the club that um, defeated them in that semi final. Playing 134 games for Sheffield United before coming to City and obviously now playing at Leicester and playing quite well in the Premier League and, and earning his first uh, England shirt as well. So it's a pretty significant sort of link between the two clubs, at least in recent history. 
Um, this week, obviously, as you as you've touched on already, Sheffield United absolutely flying in the league since their promotion from League One. They're sitting in third at the moment. Um, just looking like everything that we wish the club was at the moment. They've 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 not gone out and signed any superstars. They've still got the large nucleus of the club that or the the squad that got them promoted from League One. But they're just playing as a really good squad, a really good team. Um, I think their top scorer is Billy Sharp with six goals. So they've clearly been able to share the load around amongst all of their players. And they've got a great win against Leeds on the weekend, on I think the, the Saturday morning, this this uh, our time, and then had a pretty unfortunate loss to QPR yesterday morning. Um, but they're certainly looking in absolutely top form and will be a really formidable opponent away from home. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I think that given our woes on the road uh, for, for quite some time, uh, yes, OK, we got the, the victory at Barnsley and uh, was a massive relief you know, to get the uh, to get the, the win finally at long last. Uh, but I just think that this one probably comes a little bit too soon. And I think that certainly the manner we played at Barnsley didn't uh, leave too much for the imagination. And sadly, I think this uh, is going to be a, a very, very big task for, for City to overcome. Do you take any sort of heart from that performance from QPR midweek that there are these sorts of cracks in the Sheffield United side, or do you do you worry that perhaps after that loss they'll they'll look to rebound pretty sharply against us? I, I think the manner that the championship is played in, um, where we've certainly been accustomed to it, is we're very well aware that any team in the championship can upset anyone on the day, and I think that 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 blip at, against QPR uh, that you mentioned, whilst it would be uh, certainly something that they would be very disappointed at. I don't think it, with the 10 wins they've already accumulated, I can see them bouncing back and um, and, and seeing that as a, as a as a minor speed bump as opposed to uh, a season-defining loss that drops the team around. They, they seem to have a, a pretty good nucleus of a team and uh, I'd be very surprised if they if they weren't to continue their, their good form against us. Now, we touched on the fact that Hector was sent off uh, it was quite strange circumstances. It looked initially like he was going to get given a yellow card. It ended up being a straight red. Uh, it means that there is that hole at centre-back. Um, you've touched on the fact that you think perhaps Dawson should drop to the bench. And, of course, I think uh, with Hector being out of the team, that's unlikely to happen uh, in terms of rotating the centre defence too much. But who do you see coming in? Do you see Tamori perhaps moving across the centre-back from right-back or perhaps Mazouk? Uh, he looked quite good in that game against Bolton, which I think was his last performance for us uh, and really hasn't gotten a chance since then. Do you see him perhaps coming in? Yeah, I think Mazouk's probably the more likely of the uh, decisions to be made given his, his pre-season form. He did look to be uh, reasonably strong. I haven't seen enough of Tamori to kind of suggest that he would be the, uh, the best option. Um, given that, that, as I said, and not having seen enough of him to, to make that comment, he could well and truly be the the kind of breath of fresh air that, that we are looking for to, to shore up our defence. But I think Mizuk would be the more likely of the two to, to find himself in that um, central defensive role. And then, of course, further forward, it was an interesting midfield that Slutsky put out yesterday morning <coughs> with uh, Irvine at left mid or left wing, uh, which was a bit of an interesting one considering he's played most of his football in the centre of the park. Uh, and obviously Larson as an attacking midfielder as well was the other more interesting decision. Um, do you see Slutsky returning to a more traditional sort of setup with Krzyzewski on the left, Bowen on the right, and perhaps, uh, I mean, I guess Terrell's out injured at the moment, so perhaps either Henriksen or Irvine would be the ones to go into that more cent- the, the, the more advanced role, I guess, in midfield? Yeah, I'd probably like to see Irvine given his chance in that uh, in that role. And I think that the other reason uh, perhaps for doing that was because uh, Grzycki didn't start and was apparently uh, quite tired and uh, wasn't wasn't up to scratch, which is probably why we saw um, Irvine out on the left. Um, I'd be very surprised if that was a, a tactic employed um, in the future very often. But, um, yeah, I would certainly like to see Irvine start because... For mine, Henriksen hasn't certainly justified enough uh, for, for a starting spot um, at all this season. And then up top, do we still see Campbell as sort of the number one choice? Um, Dicko, of course, getting uh, a goal a couple of weeks ago, potentially potentially playing them together? I don't know. Do you see Campbell sort of uh, suiting that lone striker role better? Yeah, I think Fraser Campbell, it just what he offers in his work rate alone, um, he's, he's certainly done enough to justify his spot. 
Um, to play both of them, uh, Dico and Campbell, up top, uh, away from home would be an extremely brave decision, <laughs> which um, given our defensive frailties at the moment, I'd be very surprised to, to see that employed. But, I mean, it, it is one of those games where you just never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. Well, do you have a score prediction for this one? I think you sort of alluded earlier to the fact that you think United will get this job done pretty easily. Yeah, but uh, as much as it does pay me to say it, I think we're going to see a repeat of uh, a 3-1 scoreline and I think it will be uh, in favour of the Blades. Yeah, I, I, I sort of hold out hope that we can get a couple of goals on the board and maybe a 3-2 or even a 2-2 sort of result if we can get a point. That would be obviously a very positive one. Uh, and it's it's never more stark than in a game like this to see how quickly football can change, that we can play Sheffield United in uh, 20 what was it, 2014, beat them 5-2 with a significantly superior squad, playing, you know, Sagbo up top and Fryat up top and having Long and Jelovic unable to play. So actually, in some senses, playing a second string and now finding ourselves in the same division as them and not only in the same division, but actually a worse team than they are. Uh, it's quite stark to see how, how quickly fortunes can change and uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting game on the weekend, the Yorkshire Derby uh, to some extent, and it'll be uh, it'll be a very important one, I think, for us if we can get some sort of result here and, and really get back on track. But, um, uh, yeah, it's hard to see too many chances of us getting to victory here, but you never know. As you say, it's a division where anyone can beat anyone on their day. QPR managing to get a result with a pretty freak uh, goalkeeping accident. So, um fingers crossed that we can we can get some sort of result but until then um thank you for coming on logan not a problem and thank you everyone for listening in uh until next time hopefully we can get the three points against sheffield united might be back here next week uh over the international break to discuss that result if we can uh, and until next time come on city you've been listening to the official hull city australia podcast for more discussion join us on facebook in the hull city afc australian supporters group or follow us on Twitter, at Hull City AFC Oz. The music was created by Amber and Black.